Hi, everyone. I uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, great. So uh, I'm going to get started. Uh, thanks again for joining um, the webinar. This is my first uh, webinar. So if I fumble through it, then don't blame me. Um, I'm sure they'll get better uh, with time. So uh, why are we doing this webinar? Uh, well, I guess um, some of you I might know and some of you I, I might have met in person. Um, and a big question that comes up um, whenever I'm uh, meeting with brands or with other vendors or um, also just chatting internally to uh, my team here is uh, a question that always comes up is why are brands um, using 3 to, 3D to get to market faster? Uh, a bit of kind of um, background on me. Um, let me just da, 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 go over here to where my slides are. There we go. So uh, yeah, a little bit, bit of background on me. If you don't already know me and you haven't already heard my life story, um, I actually studied fashion design. Um, I worked in couture fashion uh, straight out of college. And then I moved into um, more and more technical products over the years. So I've done luggage and bulletproof body armor. And then I gradually moved closer and closer into sportswear and outdoor. Um, I've been working in the, I had been working in the kind of fashion industry for about 15 years. Uh, and then at the start of last year, I moved over uh, to Foundry. Um, they approached me to work on some um, 3D applications, specifically for 3D footwear design. And who's Foundry? So Foundry uh, has been around for about two decades now. They're uh, primarily a visual effects company, um, and that's where they have um, a lot of their heritage. So in applications like Nuke, which is the uh, standard for film compositing in the industry. Uh, we work on uh, every film from Star Wars, uh, every TV, uh, Star Wars to, gosh, every love romance film, uh, TV shows, uh, Netflix and uh, Game of Thrones and all that kind of thing. Um, almost every TV commercial that you see at the moment is using um, our software to um, create special effects. So um, I guess in addition to the special effects side of it, um, we also take that special effects um, and bring it into um, the world of product, product visualization. And, and that's where I kind of come into it, and that's where this discussion kind of comes into it. So uh, a number of years ago, we, we started working with a bunch of um, footwear brands um, just on different kinds of um, solutions for, for either modeling um, shoes or for visualizing um, shoes in their in, in their organization, in different parts of their organization. Uh, and from that, we've expanded and we've kind of uh, you know, reached out to most brands now and, and we work with almost um, almost all of the footwear brands, uh, all, all of the big footwear brands out there at the moment. So in the last 12 months, um, I've been traveling um, all around the world and you've probably had the um, <laughs> the fortune of listening to me at an event or see me um, in your in your office at some stage and thank you very much for your hospitality and your ears um, so we've really kind of seen uh, the landscape of what's happening in the industry I um, mean in all different parts of the industry and on the problems that people are trying to face and there are some similarities in those problems but there are also some, some very um, big differences as well um, one thing that came out of the, all of that travel was um, this expectation that people knew what 3D was. And I, I touched on this last week at um, the FDRA conference um, in Long Beach, um, that we used to kind of um, turn up to brands, uh, I guess about two years ago, we would, we would show up and uh, the brand would have a pretty clear idea of the application they wanted to use. They'd say, you know, I want to use Modo or uh, I want to use Roman's Cat or I want to use Rhino or something like that. And they were kind of charging there with this is exactly what we want to do. And then the, the conversation would uh, would transition to a, well, what can I do with a 3D and what can I do with those applications? But what became really apparent was that there was still a, a bit of a knowledge gap and people weren't actually sure what 3D was and what it meant for them. So those initial conversations were kind of like, you know, what does Moto do and how long will it take for me to learn and can I use my Rhino files from the factory? And then it kind of turned into, you know, where is where's the AR button and, and can I script colorway to upload variations to my PLM? But actually a lot of the uh, knowledge gap was actually around what is 3D, what is AR and VR, um, you know, 
one of the questions I was asked was like, how do I put the 3D inside the computer? And it really kind of uh, made us take a step back and and consider consider the education process around 3D and that it uh, that it needs to be refined a little bit and that that this is a journey for a lot of a lot of people um, and we need to kind of take them on that journey as well. So I mean, last week at the FGRA, I just kind of really briefly touched on what is 3D. Uh, it's it's essentially the X, Y, and Z axes. So if X and Y are your 2D uh, axes, X, Y, and Z are your 3D axes. And, but different industries refer to 3D in lots and lots of different ways. So there's AR and VR and XR and MR and uh, 2.5D, and there's renders and animation and turntables. Um, so there's lots of different language being tossed around. Um, and I think everyone's um, trying to get their head around what those different things mean. Uh, and, and something we get asked a lot, and especially when um, internally brands are trying to kind of pitch uh, their ideas or their or their um, workflows into their executive teams, is why 3D now? And and I, I'm definitely a, have been a 2D designer for many years. I I in fashion college they didn't teach uh, any kind of computer part. It was you know illustration. My uh, illustration teacher was. Uh, the the lead illustration teacher for for Gianni Versace, so I had like a really elaborate illustration style. Um, I learned Adobe Illustrator on the job, um, but you know I think this chart really shows us um, that in in kind of the late '90s um, there was a peak of everyone wanting to be a graphic designer, and there's this massive hype around you know we all need to get on board with um, graphic design, and there was a kind of competition between Coral Drawer, if anyone remembers that. A lot of the PLMs decided that they were going to introduce their own CAD tools, which was like such a great idea, um, and then we had this like this pit of disillusionment where everyone was like, well, I can't see the return on investment in um, 2D illustration in fashion design. I, I get it in graphic design, but it just, it just isn't working for me. And then out of that, we saw um, Adobe as the winner for 2D design. We saw an increase in productivity. And now we're getting to a stage where we have um, pretty good productivity out of um, 2D illustrations in Adobe Illustrator. And we have things like um, connectivity to our PLM systems. We have plugins that do a whole bunch of stuff that we, that we really enjoy as well. And then for 3D, uh, we haven't had you know such an uh, an early introduction into kind of this photorealistic 3D side, but recently in in kind of like 2014, 2013, um, and probably still up to today a little bit, there's been a lot of hype about 3D. And instead of it being you know Adobe and Corel Draw, it's around is it CAD, is it polygonal, is it free sketching, is it NURBS? Like what what is it? And and now I th I feel like we're entering this um, or we've just entered this kind of pit of disillusionment where everyone's like, holy crap, I'm saturated in 3D. I don't know which one to choose. And and I guess people are saying like, why why am I saturated in this like in 3D right? right now like what is actually happening um that's creating this kind of curve and how can i get to that productivity that i've seen in in 2d um that will that will benefit me so what we actually have seen uh in the general um yeah, workforce is this convergence of technologies so in the consumer uh interface you have things like photorealism so you have uh, you know, the ability to actually create photorealistic assets um, in 3D and with pho photorealistic materials. Um, and that's becoming quite an intimate um, process for a lot of designers at the moment. Um, and it's it's really escalated in the last number of years with uh, increases in speed in, in creating 3D models, but also the increase in speed of creating 3D materials and things like Substance coming along um, for the ride with that as well. Uh, CG and visual effects in um, cinema and TV have become like super prevalent. Almost everything has CG and visual effects. Even if you think it doesn't, it absolutely does. Um, cloud computing and um, cloud storage is really important. Um, 3D printing, AR and 300, 360 degree video. All of those things have been coming to their uh, come to kind of a precipice um, at the same time. Uh, and you're seeing that you know AR is becoming accessible for like billions of people suddenly because you know Apple's really pushed that. Um, and 3D printing, like now that we know machines can kind of do whatever we want, we want to be able to control that. So just to explain some of those things and where they sind of sit in the spectrum of um, you know why 3D now. So photorealistic, and this is like an image courtesy of New Balance, beautiful image. 
um, not an Im easy image um, to make, but this is this is photorealistic 3D, and this is when you can't tell whether an image uh, or, or a video is is a photo or a 3D render. So things like reflections and refractions and imperfections are, are kind of important there, um, and that kind of uh, two perfect uh, surfaces they they tend to look really fake. Uh, the challenge with photorealism at the moment is that you can't have it in real time. So you can't have this kind of real time rendering, which is um, real time rendering is, I guess, what you would expect um, if you're in an augmented reality environment, if you're in a game, um, or if you're in a virtual reality environment. Environment, and to get into real time, you have to really um, simplify a lot of those materials. But every year it's getting much, much better. So uh, every year at you know conferences like SIGGRAPH or whatever, NVIDIA and AMD, they announce uh, their big leaps and bounds all the time. Apple's launching you know their new hardware and stuff to support these technologies because the ultimate goal is to have this photorealism in 3D at all at all times. And you know here at Foundry, we obviously invest uh, you know a lot in that as well, specifically for um, Modo and Colorway. Uh, so I guess when you think about real time next to um, ray traced rendering, so real time is a, what you see in like Sketchfab, it's where the textures are kind of baked down so that um, you get a pretty great result, but um, you don't have that same photorealism of the light uh, bouncing off every single um, fiber of the material or every single imperfection in the you know in the leather you see on the shoe here. I hope that's loading super smoothly for everyone um, because I know internet connections can suck at times. Um, also, accessible AR, which I mentioned before. Um, I know Pokemon Go kind of makes everyone roll their eyes and it makes them a little bit sick, but actually what it did very quickly was introduce a lot of people to the idea of working in a 3D space, of interacting in a, a 3D space and having 3D graphics superimposed over uh, essentially a 2D representation of your own 3D world. So um, it was really actually quite important um, specifically for uh, you know the middle classes who had access to um, these devices and were able to consider these technologies in their workflows, and then practical AR things like you know if anyone's used the IKEA app for AR, which is you know pretty fantastic. Um, I've used the Dualax app um, to paint my walls in my house, which ended up not being successful. But that was my color choice. That was not the app. Um, we're going to see a lot of this kind of practical AR start to be distributed um, by the major brands in the coming uh, in the coming months and, and in the coming years as well, and just finding um, much more interesting solutions than just placing objects on things. Um, so that's really pushed this, you know, why 3D now as well. And then if you remember, uh, if, if anyone remembers Facebook, uh, if you remember on Facebook, um, when people suddenly started having 360 degree images, and, and for some reason, every brand had a 360 degree image, um, which was, uh, which seemed like a, a gimmick at the time. And yeah, yeah, I guess it probably was. But actually, what it did was it, it also introduced people to the idea of considering the spaces around them and considering what exists around objects and around themselves. And I don't think we can discount that idea as being, you know, impact, impactful over a period of time. It does kind of build up over time. Um, visual effects and computer generated images. So uh, they don't just you know exist in crazy sci-fi and action films. They're in every advertisement. Uh, you know every person in every film and TV show and advertisement is is in some ways um, computer generated these days as well. And then cloud and, and cloud computer power. So you know all those different um, acronyms that um, I'm not going to lie, I don't know what they all mean, um, but getting uh, getting access to um, really powerful GPUs and CPUs um, have, have come you know leaps and bounds. So my laptop now is pretty powerful. Um, it's not top of the line and I can run a 3D application. But also I can store all of that information in the cloud and I don't need to have it on my laptop. So I can kind of start working on a 3D shoe on my laptop uh, at work and then I can drop it onto Google Drive and pick it up back at home. Um, it doesn't need to exist you know, on my desktop. So um, the introduction of that has allowed us to share big files much easier and has allowed us to consume big data um, much, much easier as well. Um, 3D printing. So um, I am. I love the idea of 3D printing. I 
do not think it's a fantastic solution at the moment in the studio, but I'm always happy to be um, challenged on that. I just feel like having a six pound block of nylon um, in a meeting doesn't add the value that I want it to, but but I think that some brands have really successfully pushed that forward, You know, especially everyone knows of the uh, Futurecraft project at Adidas with Carbon. Um, and I think there's going to be um, a lot more interesting stuff coming out of um, 3D as well. But, but that introduction, again, it feeds into the why 3D has become really prevalent now. And so why the focus on footwear design? It's like, well, why us? We're just, we're just like happy little footwear designers being lovely and designing cool stuff. Um, so I would say 3D is not new for other industries. 3D has been around for a long time. Um, but what's happening at the moment is really interesting where footwear designers are starting to become um, the new graphic designers. So if you remember when graphic designers were the coolest thing ever and apologies graphic designers, like you're still cool, but maybe just not that cool anymore. Um, that has actually shifted to footwear designers. Everyone wants to be a footwear designer and they've become really celebritized. So, um, you know, uh, I guess Tinker Hatfield, um, you know, started that trend, but it's really become amplified in the last, um, at least the last couple of years and, and certainly this year as well. So uh, I, I guess, you know, I've been a designer before. Everyone in, in a brand thinks the designers are rock stars. I think mainly because they don't know what they do and they think that they just kind of flaunt into the office and throw their bag on the table a little bit like Jeff wears Prada um, and they kind of own the shop. So they're kind of terrified of them. Um, but designers, uh, I don't think we can forget that the designers are the starting point of the process. They really are um, a key driver for for creating, you know, a beautiful 3D pipeline um, within your organization and having them on board is, is really, really important. So uh, how, are, how are brands using 3D and how is it like being introduced and in where, what parts of organizations um, are people adapting to a 3D, a 3D pipeline? So again, I guess if we go back to this, this diagram where we've got um, this kind of dip of disillusionment and we're just kind of starting to come out of that now, um, that disillusionment created failure. So we saw a lot of brands um, in not just footwear, in a lot of different industries, try a bunch of different things and expecting this huge company-wide digital transformation. And they wanted like speed and magic and you know, fantasy and all this kind of thing. Um, but I don't think uh, we had reached that, that time when it was um, a convergence of all those technologies to give them the... Uh, the perspective to look back and and uh, start to make real change and real drive towards uh, return on investment, and creating a cross cross functional environment where kind of two D could exist with three D or they could transition into three D. You know, it wasn't possible because there were so many huge knowledge gaps and so much resistance as well. So, so we've realised that knowledge gap, and you know, our goal is to provide you know a more holistic approach. So. I guess in the different areas of the company where they're being introduced, you have obviously the iterative, iterative design process. So this is the designers, the color of material designers, all those different design functions um, interacting with, um, with 3D, internal line reviews, supply chain communication, so liaising with your factories, um, archiving, may not have thought of that, but actually creating a digital archive of all of your assets. Um, you can only imagine uh, it saves a lot of space. It also means that assets are accessible for a number of years, or uh, for indefinitely, really. Um, retail buy-in, so selling to um, wholesalers or retailers with those digital assets. Visual merchandising, so you know we work with a couple of um, different brands on um, virtual reality store mock-ups. Um, E-commerce solutions, once you've got something in 3D, you don't need to photograph it. Um, and then virtual assets, which I'll touch on at the end, which is like my kind of super exciting thing that I like to talk about at the moment. Um, so iterative design, um, I guess this is, you know, the designer being able to take their idea and model something uh, that looks photo real that they can kind of sell into people, sell into their um, other designers and their design team, sell into their design manager um, and sell into, um, you know, the merchandisers and that sort of thing. So, you know, once you've got a 3D model, you can do things like smooth animations and, and videos and, um, or you can render flat images. 
And what's become really interesting in iterative, iterative design um, in 3D modeling in the last kind of two years is a focus on um, these four sections that um, we like to talk about. And, and these are uh, like procedural modeling where you have non-destructive workflows. So this isn't about like undoing a bunch of things. This is about taking something out and slotting it back in. And we also have you know, specific uh, focus on tools for those operations. Uh, so if you're making shoes, you're not going into a 3D app and thinking, you know what, I'm gonna have to create all these stitches from scratch. So we've developed a whole bunch of tools specific to the footwear workflow. There's a whole bunch of stitching tools um, currently in 12.2, and there's lacing tools which are coming out in February next year, which can save you know hours or, or days of time um, displacement mapping for simpler base styles where you're doing things like perforations and embossed patterns. So that's a fantastic workflow for um, definitely for people that are doing lots of heels and dress shoes. Um, and then finally, mesh fusion. Uh, so I guess everyone's, you know, really aware of the focus on uh, tooling shapes becoming really important. So, um, you know, your midsoles uh, shape and, uh, you know, perforations or whatever, materials and everything, um, there's been a shift of focus away from uppers and to, um, to modeling the tooling and giving that um, modeling to the designers as well. So um, with Mesh Fusion, uh, being able to kind of slap things together and the meld together really quickly um, has become a fantastic tool in that iterative design process. For internal line reviews, so again, passing those uh, you know beautiful renders um, over to your uh, merchandisers in, a, in an internal line review, it, it really gives them the control to make a confident decision. So uh, the conversation between the designer and the merchandiser or the buyer um, is crystal clear. No one's making an assumption that you know this model that we're seeing here that 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 piece of plastic where the metcon is that that's glossy. You know, we're not having to assume that 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 black is a is a matte black, we can see it perfectly. And then taking that into uh, an application, you know, like Colorway and being able to get people to drag and drop colors onto different things while still in a photorealistic setting um, is has become really important as well. So this is something, you know, I shared online uh, this week. It was what I did on the way to the FDRA conference, but it's this, you know, ability to create you know, a hundred variations really quickly in like 15 minutes um, and have those linked together and and, um, uh, and interact with each other. Interacting with your factories. So I guess, you know, Southeast Asia is the manufacturing powerhouse um, and the prevalence of email was no coincidence. So being able to communicate with your factories via email meant that they could receive information much, much faster. But I still see crappy samples coming back from the factory because they're still trying to interpret 2D CADs uh, and they're doing the best that they can with those 2D CADs. When we have a 3D photorealistic model, there's really no area for interpretation. Um, the factory can come back and sort of say, you know, this is technically not possible, but there aren't, uh, there's a visual marker there so that they can say, well, it's technically not possible, but I can completely see what you're trying to achieve here uh, with your materials, with your structure and shape um, and with the proportion specifically the proportions, they become uh, really, really Im Im uh, important. Um, also, I, I really love that quote that you know, I've had for like, oh my God, so many years. Whenever you try to sample something in the factory, it's like, oh, we only have this color available in the market. And for many years, I was like, where the hell is this market? And why can't I just go there and choose the colors that I've got? I guess having something in 3D, you don't need that uh, that, that response of going to uh, going and getting you know the available color from the market. You can do kind of whatever you want. Um, archiving is an interesting one that's um, come about for us. Uh, we've been working with um, a couple of brands now on creating archiving solutions. Um, a lot of brands want to access their historical archives for um, design iteration stages uh, and, and having a catalog, a digital catalog available to designers and, um, and other people within the organization. Uh, so we've, we've been able to create some kind of semi-automated semi, semi um, metadata tagging so that uh, people don't need to go looking for very specific things and know where to find them, that they can kind of search for things uh, by color, by shape, um, and applying, you know, some over time, some machine learning um, algorithms to that so that they will auto tag themselves. Um, but archiving is, a, is an unusual one, which probably you wouldn't um, suspect that, uh, a fantastic thing that comes out of the 3D process, um, but a really valuable one. And then retail buy-in, once you've got a 3D asset, viewing that 3D asset in different lights. So setting up different lighting situations. And I hope they've 
come through correctly on everyone's screens because I know that the the top left one is very very uh, poorly lit, uh, which is definitely the intention. So uh, once you've got a model in three D, being able to view it in different lighting situations. So here's this product in Walmart. Here it's here's this product in Foot Locker. Here's what it's going to look like in our studio. Here's what it's going to look like in another studio by the window. Um, you know, we did a, a really nice mock up recently of. Um, a pair of headphones in a store window, uh, which was lit by LED, but had a street light, which was um, like one of those ye olde street, street lights in, in London. Uh, and like the interesting light reflections off that product made it look completely different to what it looked like in the studio. The color was completely different. And the, buy, the buyer at the time was just like, well, that that's not the color that I want to appear in the store. So they could make a discussion, they could create a discussion with their visual merchandising team, whether they wanted to alter the lights in the store or whether they wanted to um, alter the color of the product. Um, onto visual merchandising, VR is already being utilized by, you know, some big brands to avoid creating physical store mock-ups, which I, which I know some other brands um, do. Uh, and in VR, we've seen some really, really interesting stuff where once, you've, once you're in the VR space, you can kind of walk around a store and uh, see that that objects are in your way, or you can see the clash of colors, or you can see the the um, the clash of objects and and their displays as well. So um, it's a really fantastic experience for the visual merchandiser without having the cost of um, setting something up. Uh, in e-commerce, once you have a model in three D, it negates the uh, need for traditional photography. So you know, once you've got control of a 3D virtual asset, it just becomes an extension of the designer's workflow to hand it over into marketing. And I really like that statistic that uh, that came out uh, last week, um, which I'll share the details of the report, but I can't think of it off the top of my head now, but uh, it said that even if a customer purchases uh, in a physical store, 80% of those purchases were digitally influenced. So they were influenced by social media, by the website, by however else you're creating customer touch points digitally. Uh, they're still affecting those physical store sales more than you can imagine. And so those those digital touch points become really, really important and the value of um, creating the most uh, in intimate experience is really, really important. Um, and then finally, uh, virtual assets. So this is the stuff that I'm super excited about at the moment that you know you can't share too much about and and the work that we're doing at the moment isn't for Fortnite, but I'm just using that as an example and I stole that from Google Images, so don't sue me. But uh, the focus you know, for brands has always been on manufacturing physical products. So let's get the lowest price from the factory, let's get the cheapest factory uh, with the best quality, let's, uh, the factory's got to have capacity because we need to get those shoes to Los Angeles or wherever to put in the store so somebody can buy it or so that we can ship around the world. But I really like the idea of what if the product never needs to be manufactured. So what if the manufacturing is just the design? So once you've got a 3D asset, you can sell it to a gamer that's playing you know, a game like Fortnite. Uh, they can put it on their character and they might buy them for $20 and you've just made $19.95 because it didn't take you that much. Uh, to make that in 3D or to offer that, you know, custom um, pair in in 3D game. Um, also, as you start to see the introduction of um, the Oculus VR experiences at Facebook and other ways that we're interacting with each other and creating avatars, whether it's the kind of emoticons on uh, your Apple device or you've got your uh, yeah your Snapchat filters or whatever, being able to buy you know, apparel and shoes uh, with the brand on it for a cost is going to become a massive, massive business for a lot of, uh, of the bigger brands, a lot of people that are um, getting on board with this, you know, quite soon. So that brings me to, I, I guess, the single asset pipeline, which is a, a really nice journey that we like to um, explain to people. So I guess it's taking all of those different elements that I just mentioned and putting them into uh, this idea of once it's created by the uh, designer in the design stage, it stays in 3D and then it gets spat out into lots of different areas of the business. And I think that's really important because when we consider the return on investment in a 3D uh, pipeline, everyone focuses on, well, how is it going to save the designer uh, time and money? How is the designer going to give me return on investment? But actually what we see is the return on investment tends to come from uh, all of those different touch points. The designer is only the initiator of that process. And it's, it's important not to um, dwell too much on 
the designer providing all of the ROI there. Uh, you really need to have a connected asset journey for that. Our goal is to be uh, is to be a digital product creation partner and and drive that single asset pipeline. We've moved away from this idea of you know you buy a seat of Moto and you will learn 3D and be a superstar. To it's a journey, and we're happy to um, to educate people and be on that journey now. So that's me in 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 one breath. Um, I hope that was useful and that kind of explained um, a bit of why this this introduction to 3D, this this um, 3D market for footwear designers has kind of come out of the blue. Um, I'm opening it up to questions now. Um, and if no one asks me anything, I will be super sad. But also I, I have some pre-questions that people sent me um, who said they couldn't be here. Um, so yeah, please feel free to um, yeah type in your questions. I'm happy to answer them, um, and I will um, yeah I will take a sip of water while I'm waiting. Okay, so obviously I'm super sad. No questions coming through. So I'm going to kick it off with a question that I was asked um, about this webinar. And was I going to talk about um, why would you choose Modo over Rhino, over SolidWorks, over Roman's CAD? And I think it's the million dollar question that you know everyone asks. Um, and I don't think that it's about choosing one solution. I'm not of the mindset that you need to get rid of Rhino or get rid of SolidWorks or whatever else you have. I think they're part of the solution. And I think they're part of this journey that, you know, this 3D journey that everyone's on. Um, I think each of those applications um, have their benefits. Um, they also have their negatives as well. Um, and it's just finding the place that, that works you know, in your pipeline. Um, another thing I uh, get asked a lot is, does Modo create patterns? So can I flatten out my mo model and make uh, paper patterns that my factory can cut and do all that sort of thing uh, with? The answer is yes and no. So uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And to be honest, it's not something that we originally planned for. It's something that's come out of a lot of discussions with people using Modo for footwear. Um, and there are ways to do it, um, but there are solutions that are um, intimate that we provide specifically for, for brands as well. Uh, another question I get asked is, can I 3D print from Modo? Yes, you can. Uh, there are ways to um, essentially bake the geometry on that object and create a solid object um, and print it out there. Definitely for um, people using Mesh Fusion for tooling, we get a lot, a lot of people um, creating tooling and printing it out overnight. And then finally, I get asked, um, can I create animations? Yes, animations are hella easy, um, especially if you have a template to just pull a shoe out, put a shoe in, um, and play a turntable. Um, if anyone else shows me an exploding um, shoe, animation, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. I just hate seeing them. I've seen them for so many years now. Okay. I've got some questions here. It's just my chat thing wasn't working. So uh, my colleague Manya has run in with some questions. Uh, where is the best place to sell characters? Um, I'm always curious of expanding what I sell online. Um, I don't think there is a best place at the moment. I feel like that, um, market, so that avatar market is still um, being developed at the moment. Um, I know that the Oculus team at Facebook have started offering them for free um, for experiences in their VR, but um, I'm not sure who's going to own the store space. I'm probably speaking out of turn if someone in our own company is trying to do that, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they are. Um, 
what do we have details on the stitching and lacing tools uh yes for um stitching there's been a lot of stitching um conversations at the moment around modo and something that we um you see in the community forums um especially with the incredible uh william vaughan who is um constantly posting and never sleeping um he's already um presented some of the, the stitching tools for Modo 12.2. Um, otherwise, um, in Modo 12.2, which comes out on the 15th of November, there is um, stitching tools embedded in the application. Um, da, 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 da. I've got lots of questions here now, so that's super exciting. Um, da, 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 da. How separate is the design for the 3D model? Two rolls together. So that's an interesting question. How separated is the design um, process from the 3D model generation process? Are the two roles working together or is it the same role? Um, I've seen both. I've seen um, organizations where 2D designers have uh, successfully transitioned into 3D. Um, I've seen organizations where 2D designers have found their sweet spot in 3D. So whether it's um, picking up sketching, uh, picking up, you know, something some interesting point of the 3D process and not all of it. Um, and I've also seen um, organizations where designers sit alongside 3D designers and essentially work as a team. And uh, what happens there is you tend to see a replacement of the developer role because the actual specification process can be somewhat automated. And having been a technical developer myself, that does obviously scare the shit out of me, but it's also really exciting that that, that is a, almost entirely a visualization process that's connected to um, a database now. Uh, next question. Oops. Uh, is, there a is there an artist uh, tried to model characters? For you? Okay, is, model, is Modo based on product design generally, or is there uh, any artist to try, or is it for any artist to try to create models and characters and creatures for games and stuff like that. Um, actually, Modo is definitely not just based around product design. It's just a happy outcome that kind of um, came from came from users wanting a solution to, you know, an artist-friendly workflow for the design process. Uh, Modo is actually, you know, majority used for creating characters and creatures for games and visual effects. So, um, absolutely, there are probably more, way more tutorials online for creating creatures. And um, I know there's a bunch of um, fantastic community contributors um, in the Modo space that can help you there. So, I think jump on the community pages. Also, there's a free trial of Modo and. Um, I think during the, the trial process, they give you a bunch of kind of prompts for that sort of thing. How do I find people to uh, train uh, in Modo in the US uh, on the East Coast? Yeah, so I think um, if you're in an organization, um, just email design at foundry.com and the team there will connect you with um, either someone from our team or someone else that we would recommend. Um, in addition to um, our services of training, uh, we've also started working with uh, Pencil on uh, teaching different um, 3D elements there. So teaching footwear designers um, how to go straight from, you know, how to essentially start their process in 3D. Da, 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 da. And I like that some people are responding to other people's questions. That saves me a lot of time. Um, yes, yeah. So I guess if you've got the CAD file, that's um, thank you for everyone for replying to each other's questions. But if you've got CAD files, Modo is um, super neat at uh, digesting CAD files and making them usable for um, your visualization purposes. So, you know, we know that um, every factory in China is going to have your tooling set up in Rhino. And that means that we don't really, you know, want you to have to start all over again. So by, uh, you know, natively, Modo will support uh, Rhino 3DM files um, being brought into the application. And then as you get more sophisticated and, and into some of the more complicated CAD files, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, CAD plugin tools, which will which will converse, uh, which will essentially, yeah, translate those into the Moto application. 
Ah, cool. Are the other model to create flat patterns. Uh, yes, there are ways, um, if you're working in handbags, to reverse engineer the model to create flat patterns. Uh, we do do that with a number of brands. It is quite technical because it depends on what output you want from that file. Um, but it is something that, again, that's re that's really something that the guys can talk to you about um, if you email design at foundry.com. Um, they will talk you through what solutions we offer there. Um, uh, 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 I'm not going to answer that one. Uh, yeah, you, can you design print repeats in Modo? Absolutely. It's just a tiling function inside of Modo. And uh, you can also do that in Colorway and a bunch of different applications. There's super, there's a huge number of um, solutions for creating repeats um, inside inside different applications, but specifically in, in Modo. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I hope I answered everyone's questions. I think um, no one asked me about my beautiful bald, bald face, but that's fine. Uh, if you have any more questions, please, please, please email me design at foundry dot com that's design at foundry dot com um, I, the video will be available after this call so if you want to share that with anybody you can go ahead and do that um, or download it or whatever the interweb gets you these days um, and yeah I hope to speak to you soon we'll be having another webinar in a month and uh, yeah take care enjoy your day